Okay, good afternoon. I'm Julia Copley, Head of Operations, and on behalf of the NGAA, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon, which is being delivered by Ecclesiastical. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping points. Please ensure your microphone and your camera is off. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screen, which will be answered during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If we do run out of time and don't have an opportunity to put your questions to our speaker, this will be answered post-event. This presentation is accredited for CPD points if relevant to your ongoing professional development program, and the video and slide deck will be available on our website post-event. The recording will also be uploaded to the MGAA YouTube channel. As always, please take time to respond to our feedback survey, which will be issued after this webinar, as this does enable us to deliver the best quality events to our membership. So today's webinar, Ecclesiastical Delegated, What's the Difference, is being delivered by Anthony Osborne, Head of Schemes, Corporate Business. Anthony today has very kindly stepped in at the last minute as Tony Fletcher, our original presenter, has unfortunately contracted COVID. So Anthony has been with Ecclesiastical for 10 years, currently as Head of Schemes, managing the delegated authority side of, of the corporate business division, which includes elements of underwriting, pricing, product development and business development, all delivered with the help of a dedicated schemes team. Anthony's previous roles with leading insurers and brokers over a 30-year career has given Anthony a wide market experience with a strong focus on developing and managing insurance products that deliver fair value for customers, broker and insurer. So Anthony, if I might hand over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, hello uh, uh, and welcome to everyone and thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, it is a gorgeous day out there, so I do appreciate you're uh, uh, your joining this. Um, uh, and they do say you should never start a presentation with an apology, so I'm going to start by apologising uh, on behalf of uh, Tony Fletcher. Um, I spoke to him this morning, he's genuinely, um, he would have made it if he could, but uh, COVID has uh, unfortunately uh, uh, got him and uh, he's, he's, he's retired to bed for the day. So um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be doing this. It's a, uh, it's a subject I'm uh, you know, directly involved in and so um, we'll, we'll still be able to have a good session today. Um, so yes, it is, it is exactly that. Ecclesiastical delegated, what's the difference? Um, just in terms of agenda, there's a few things uh, to run through today. Um, there's a, there's, we've got some listed learning objectives, which I'll talk about. But, um, this is really all about giving you a good feel for ecclesiastical uh, delegated space. Um, and there's a, there's a fair bit to get through, but, you know, I think we'll probably run for about 40 minutes or so um, and always talk about um, We are part of a bigger group, so I want to talk firstly about that, but then talk more about... Um, the DA process and the claims proposition and the value and the added growth. Um, there's, a, there's a slide that often sort of um, raises a few eyebrows around risk appetite. So um, we'll, we'll run through that when we get to it. Um, and then we'll wrap up towards the end with um, sharing some of what we've learned with um, a lot that we've been through in the last sort of 12 months or so um, around the regulatory side of delegated authorities as well. So um, it's quite a bit to cover. Um, in terms of um, learning objectives, um, and in, in a sense, I guess they're my objectives um, of, of what I need to get across. Uh, we've got um, a piece around the ecclesiastical business model. Um, so I'd really sort of want to make sure everybody understands the, um, the, the, the model in terms of delegated authority, but also a bit more about the group that we belong to. Um, and how we create those partnerships in DA that really sort of look to grow um, grow the business collectively. Um, we have a, effectively a six-step process that I want to talk through, which is really about the way we deliver DAs. And that's from the very start, the initial conversations all the way through to ongoing um, support for them. Uh, and as I say, finally, I want to share um, a piece um, around the, particularly around the regulatory side that we've 
uh, we've been working through over the last um, 12 months and so. So those are the uh, those are effectively my objectives or your learning objectives. Um, but let's start talking, first of all, about ecclesiastical. Um, and before we do that, uh, I want to talk about um, a bit more about who we are and what makes us. So hopefully um, in the last week or so, you'll have seen a lot of uh, industry press and stuff on LinkedIn around the fact that um, ecclesiastical insurance is part of a, a much wider and bigger family of companies that um, uh, rebranded rebrand in the last week or so to the Benefact Group. Um, and that describes much better the, um, the overall objective of that group. Um, ultimately, we're owned by the Benefact Trust, um, which is charitable ownership, which is really unique uh, model in financial lines. Uh, and that basically means that we exist as a, as a family of companies um, to effectively do good and make our profits available to charities and good causes. Uh, and in fact, we just did a milestone recently where um, it's a huge number, but we, we donated over 100 million to charities over the last four years, which is uh, something we're very proud of. So, um, yeah, that's a really key part. If there's one thing that differentiates us, um, not just the way we do business and the products and everything we, you know, we deliver, it is the fact that we're part of a group that ultimately gives our profit and money, um, not just to uh, corporate shareholders as such, but um, to those in need. And then Ecclesiastical is just one brand within that. Um, and therefore, you know, that's the bit I'm talking about today. And if you think about the insurance side, we're just the insurance side. We've also got an investment arm, um, which is largely traded under a brand called Eden Tree, uh, with a strong focus on ESG, socially responsible investing. Um, and we, uh, within the group as well, there's a number of um, brokers. Some of them you might be familiar with names like um, SEIB and Lysis. Um, but, yeah, there's about 30 brands uh, within the Benefact group uh, across um, the UK, Ireland, Canada and Australia. So probably hopefully, you know, gives you a feel for the for the type of business are and the, the, the breadth and stretch that we've got. But yeah, just focusing on the insurance side. So um, the name Ecclesiastical tells you something of the heritage there. We, 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 we grew out of providing um, direct insurance to the Anglican Church. Um, and we still hugely dominate in that space, obviously. Um, but increasingly, um, over many years, actually, um, we, we've grown um, other arms of the business, if you like. Uh, and we've got three regional businesses. They operate out of Birmingham, London and Manchester. Um, and they open market trading through brokers uh, where the, um, the focus is around real specialisms. So heritage. Um, for example, we'll insure um, uh, stately homes, um, you know, Blenheim Palace, um, Burley House, um, other heritage risks, Royal Albert Hall, all those kind of uh, things, um, down to the smaller scale stuff as well. Heritage, education, charity, uh, non-Anglican faith, uh, community and property specialism. So in many ways, Ecclesiastical is famed for some of that stuff. Um, but the bit we do um in in my area if you like the delegated authorities um is something that increasingly is part of the business and a growing part of the business so um we've also got specialisms around private client and real estate but of course today um, is all about the delegated authority side of things um, and they also say with slides don't read through all the bullet points um but that's exactly what i'm going to do here because there's a few uh key so um, we are UK based um, capacity. Um, the main appetite is going to be around property led schemes and delegated authorities. But Anthony, sorry, just to interrupt, we, we keep losing the volume. I don't know whether you've experienced this before. I don't know. It might just be the way I'm hearing it. But um, I just wanted to make you aware. I think we can still, it's still good enough to um, follow what you're saying. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that for delegates, that you do fade out momentarily, but, but come back in. So apologies to delegates okay. if it's um, detracting, but um, as I say, just wanted to acknowledge and make you aware of that. Yeah, thanks for doing that. I'll try, uh, I, yeah, hopefully raising my voice or uh, just staying still might help, but let me do that. 
Um, so yeah, just walking through this slide, um, in terms of um, UK-based capacity, appetite in property, but casualty is obviously a very significant part of, uh, of the arrangements with the delegated authorities as well. A-rated capacity, which I'm sure is um, highly relevant to, uh, to MGAs and, uh, and other DA holders. Um, it really is a significant part already of the business, um, but also forms a really significant part of the growth plans. Uh, and we've been doing um, delegated authority for 30 years. Uh, and it's really great that some of the original brokers that we worked with are continuing to work with us 30 years on. So testament to those um, relationships. Um, as it stands, we've got 75 um, individual delegated authorities, 75 different products. Um, that has quite a few implications around the regulatory stuff that I'll talk about later. Um, all delivered through a dedicated DA team. So there's a team mostly based in Gloucester uh, that is, um, un, you know, 24-7 um, almost uh, in terms of looking after delegated authorities. And the thing about the risk appetite, and we'll share some details and some examples of the sort of thing we do, um, it's worth making the point that it is beyond ecclesiastical's normal specialist niche. So although we're known and famed for heritage, charity, etc., cetera, um, many of our schemes aren't in that space at all. We can do, uh, you know, within DAs, we can do stuff really quite, uh, quite wide of that mark. Um, we support brokers and we support MGAs. Uh, we're always happy to talk to uh, more and more MGAs about um, their needs and whether we can uh, support with that. Um, we really, the key bit we're looking for is to recognise the expertise um, of the cover holder. Um, we've got our expertise, we've got the things that we can support, but the most successful partnership is where, uh, you know, a cover holder can bring real expertise um, and, and collectively, you know, create something quite, uh, quite strong. Uh, now, with the delegated authorities, the probably 80 to 90 percent of any decision making we generally look to put in the hands of the DA holder. Um, but of course, there are always going to be a handful of um, situations that need referral into it. Within the team, we've got a load of expert underwriters that are, you know, there to take those um, referrals, and uh, you know, they, they really do get to the sort of core understanding of the uh, the business as well, just to help with that underwriting flexibility. Um, we also, within the team, we've got, um, a, a, it says new business there, but that's not in the traditional sense of day-to-day -day new business. That's more new schemes and new DAs and new uh, MGA arrangements. So it's a team that's focused on onboarding and delivering those new arrangements. So that's, a good, that, that's all they do. That is their entire focus. Um, we like to, rather than just drop you into a big team, we like to link you up with a technical lead underwriter and relationship manager on each portfolio so that really you can just start to build that joint working relationship. Um, now Ecclesiastical has a really strong risk management um, team and proposition. Um, there's uh, probably I think about 60 individuals dotted around the UK. Uh, we will go out and do site surveys and valuations if needed uh, or often for maybe some of the delegated authority businesses, other risk management solutions that we can put in place, which I'll talk about as well. And a really strong piece uh, around claims. So I've got a, a slide or two on claims I want to mention. And then last but not least is um, the, the, the regulation um, side of things. So um, the FCA required us to do quite a bit more over the last sort of 12 months, um, particularly in the DA space. So um, I'll share some more detail of that, but that's a, a bit of a whiz through just to give you a sense of the uh, sort of breadth and depth of the DA offering. Just touching on claims, because I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, important, and I think nearly every insurer will probably tell you that, um, sorry, uh, that, that claims is a significant part of their offering and, uh, you know, the world lead, et cetera. Um, I have worked at a number of different insurers. Genuinely, I think with ecclesiastical, that claims piece is just that 
um, bit more personal and uh, human touch. So um, we, we've got within any claim situation, the customer we understand is uh, at their point of need. Uh, we've got the effectively the process where we would give a nominated individual to the customer. They'll have somebody to speak to about their claim. They'll have their direct telephone number. We don't run call centers with thousands of people. Uh, cues and hold music and everything aren't part of the proposition. It's just about instant contact with the person that knows your claim so that as a customer, you don't have to repeat yourself and move around sort of department to department. Uh, and as that first conversation goes on with the customer, we really just say, you know, what would work for them? Um, how, how do they want us to communicate with them? Do they want email? Um, do they want, you know, phone calls? What level of frequency do they want in terms of updates? So um, a really strong personal aspect to it as well. And you can see some of the awards uh, and things that we've, we've won. And, um, you know, I think um, that net promoter score, for example, just stands out, you know, very, very, very strong, uh, you know, considering it is an area that sometimes, uh, you know, can can be frustrating for customers. We do uh, we do work with partners within claims as well. So inevitably, we, we see some particularly large claims. Um, as I say, we, we ensure some very, very significant um, properties. Um, so where those sort of things happen, we've got a really um, strong relationship with complex um, loss adjusters, uh, major loss adjusters, et cetera. Uh, and they, you know, effectively that whole supply chain, whether it's for a large claim or a, a unique specialist claim. Um, and there's an example there maybe within a delegated authority we do for high-end musical instruments where um, as we went into writing that business, we put in place a specialist arrangement um, with a loss adjuster that's very, um, you know, skilled in that particular area. So any any suppliers basically go through a really rigorous um, sort of uh, approval process before they um, before they come part of our claim solution. And when it comes to delegated authorities, again, claims isn't just that kind of afterthought that you know if something goes wrong for the customer, they drop into the normal arrangements. We've got a team that looks after claims on the delegated authorities. They know the unique features of the particular scheme uh, or arrangement or delegated authority they know the bespoke covers that we've agreed uh, and they you generally you know got that good in-depth understanding and and sometimes as well it's appropriate and we're happy to um, delegate claims authority as well as underwriting authority so that you know uh, the controls with um, effectively the, the sort of intermediary in that space uh, and then rather than just take our word for it um, grace church is a um, effectively a, a sort of a, an external quality um, mark um, that recently uh, we've got some results we're proud of. So we had to include a slide on that. Um, we were rated as outstanding. The scores were basically um, best in, you know, best, best that was um, effectively surveyed uh, and by quite a mile as well. So particular strengths around uh, speed that we were dealing with um, customer inquiries and claims and uh, relationships and expertise and communication levels. So uh, across the board there, Grace Church, just, um, you know, super proud of, of what we were able to get there. And uh, it's good to get that external validation of all the hard work that goes on there. So just moving on now to the, um, the areas in which we can create so I think with a delegated authority, what we're not doing is basically just trying to win them and then just standing back and just say, look, you know, we're built uh, uh, see how it runs. This is this is a number of different ways in which we can develop uh, and help um, work with you in long term partnership. So in terms of um, proposition development uh, with, you know, we, we, we've actually, a lot of the management team have been trained to run, um, you know, design workshops and uh, creative tools that help, you know, and frameworks that we understand that uh, help how you can develop really strong value propositions where you really understand the customer's needs. They're great processes for really starting to um, put yourself in the shoes of the customer and design the right solutions and things that 
uh, that, that will add value. So um, we run these with uh, a lot of our DA holders. Uh, they're really fun as well as sort of great ways to come out with something unique and interesting. Um, beyond that, we do marketing support and consultancy um, within the marketing team. There's some uh, really strong skill sets around whether it's digital marketing, campaign development, um, reviewing customer journeys. So we tend to, um, with our marketing colleagues, sit down, look at current activity in terms of marketing, what's worked well for you, uh, produce a bespoke report that helps with recommendations and strategies and where it's appropriate, we can you know, put a bit of a financial contribution towards that as well. And then I'm not quite sure why it's shown in dark black here. It almost stands out as the strongest piece of this, uh, but it's just one of the five. Um, but Marketplace is essentially um, making available um, any product or proposition that we've got. And there's a lot of specialist stuff in there. Um, we just make it available on our ecclesiastical website where uh, any of our agents uh, can can access it uh, and make contact with yourselves or with the broker that uh, that's running that product if they want to accept um, effectively sort of sub broke business into it. So just creates a cross sell um, environment marketplace. We talked briefly about um, risk management earlier, um, and, and all we would say here is that I think um, where it's a larger risk, we do uh, a very thorough on-site survey, valuation, you know, risk improvement recommendations and what have you. But increasingly, we're finding that um, it's not always cost effective to do that. We can do desktop valuations. Uh, we've invested in various tools that help us do that. Um, customer accepts the valuation. We obviously we waive average. We look at uh, a number of additional things where customers can get benefit from all our knowledge in risk management. We produce um, volumes of um, risk guidance notes uh, that can be provided to customers. Um, we've got um, a, a risk advice line where customers can ring any time, any day, just basically just for a bit of advice on whether it's something to do with health and safety or running an event or anything that might be on their mind. Uh, we've got um, a risk management portal that's been developed where customers can just run through some tailored questions uh, that will help them understand how they're doing in terms of managing uh, the risks within their particular business or um, charity. And it produces a tailored report for them uh, through the back of that. So risk management isn't just the traditional on-site visit. There's a, there's a whole range of support and activity there that we look to provide. And then again, we keep coming back to it, but um, there's a final slide on this around the regulatory stuff. So I'll pick that one up towards the end. But maybe the point to say there is um, with many of the delegated authorities, the, the product ownership is, um, is effectively that of co-manufacturer. So the regulatory piece sits equally across um, both parties. What we've done is we've built um, effectively frameworks and structures that um, help um, where needed um, any other party to to go through all that um, with us. Uh, we take on, effectively, we take on the majority of the legwork as well, but there's a, there's a lot in there. It's a very thorough process and, um, you know, it can be a bit daunting for, for some businesses to, um, to have to do it. But, you know, because um, we've put the time into it and we've invested, actually, we developed a team of, um, we recruited three extra people last year to help us do that. And so, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's another part of the proposition. But those, those are five areas beyond the obvious underwriting, pricing, generally providing the delegated authority. Those are just five areas where we're looking to have that much more sort of closer partnership development idea. Okay, so, um, yeah, this is the slide that... Um, uh, it's always interesting. You, you do see a few raised eyebrows when we talk through it. Um, and, and this is um, rather than, I think, doing risk appetite by trying to sort of summarise it on a page with a few sort of criteria, it actually brings it to life more if we share um, some examples of genuine delegated authorities that uh, we've either still got on the books or we've written in recent years. Um, and, and there's some really interesting ones immediately. Um, just picking a few of these for discussion. So um, at the top left there, um, we've got 
farming, vineyards and farming. Um, so that's that's so far outside of ecclesiastical's normal um, specialist areas of heritage and education and charity. Um, it really is specialist. We partner with delegated authority holders there that uh, have got good, strong understanding of the market and um, underwriting expertise. Um, we we developed internally. We developed skills. We recruited um, people in with the right farm underwriting background and. We've engaged the right um, farm um, claims adjusters and everything. So just gives you an example of where we really do push that risk appetite and do some unusual stuff. Um, if you go actually to the bottom right corner next, you've got um, more unusual things there again. So um, whilst we said we're property led for delegated authorities, there's one there that is entirely casualty led um, for PL within pet insurance. So uh, pet insurer approach, uh, approached us. They're happy to write all the pet insurance side of it. Uh, they've got all the infrastructure around um, vet arrangements, managing vet fees and dealing with pet underwriting, but they weren't comfortable with the PL side of it, uh, which essentially is dog bites. Um, so we, we work with them and effectively we embed the provision of the cover into their, into their main product. Um, what others might be interesting, maybe in the second column towards the bottom there, there's, there's a couple that are probably more examples of where they're a bit more aligned to our uh, niche in terms of faith. So you've got Buddhist temples uh, and religious orders in there. Um, there's a really interesting one, third column along, third one down, um, military assets and kit. Um, that probably does need some explaining. So military assets. Um, especially with all the horrendous stuff that's going on in Ukraine. It, it might get misunderstood about one as, um, I don't know, Tomahawk missiles and tanks or something like that. So it's not that kind of military asset. This is more the um, regalia and the, the valuable um, sort of um, uh, stuff that a, a regiment might own. So, you know, lots of historic items, high value silver, going back to, you know, um, Crimean wars and all sorts of, historic events and that uh, and also the kit as well so um, as you join the military you get issued a load of kit the first thing you have to do uh, as, a, as a squaddy or a military personnel is ensure the kit so um, yeah really just the idea of this slide is just to give you a sense of the breadth of um, uh, breadth of appetite we've got there um, there's there's not much that we're not interested in at least looking at and I think maybe the one standout area is going to be Motor as a company, uh, we withdrew from Motor, I think it was 2012. Um, so anything wheels based, um, we're not able to support, but uh, really broad, um, broad appetite. Um, uh, yeah, and hopefully that slide brings that to life. Okay, so um, we've talked about um, being part of the Benefact Group, being uh, a unique business model in terms of generating profits that give them clarity. We talked about the delegated authority uh, in terms of appetite and just the way we operate. Um, this next piece is a bit more about the, um, perhaps the question you know we're answering here is, how do, I, how do I start a conversation with ecclesiastical about a delegated authority uh, and what would that journey look like? So, um, this is something that we can take from our um, marketing material around our, you know, our blueprint. Um, and, and there's really six key steps. Um, and it moves through from the very initial conversations and not just the bit where we build it and stand back, but the ongoing continued support for it as well. So step one is the general sort of getting to know you, an initial discussion, um, as formal as you want it to be. Uh, and, and really, it's just sort of having a quick chat about what sort of business we're talking about and looking at uh, how it could work. And, you know, without making it too structured, we've got a set number of questions we'd work through there. Inevitably, there's going to be uh, a bit of number crunching um, because it is, you know, uh, it is effectively a numbers um, piece of work to look through it. So we'll gather as much data as we can. We'll, we'll work with you to understand what you're trying to achieve uh, there and we'll look at that. Um, we start to introduce at step three more people across the business. 
Um, we've got, you know, underwriting, compliance, marketing, regulatory should be on that list really now, et cetera. And then we're really moving forward at this stage. We're starting to get it built and we're looking at things in more detail. Um, and then once it's live, um, we spend the first six months, we don't move it from the, the new schemes team to drop it into the existing schemes. First six months are all about checking everything's working, that the partnership's working as intended and that everybody's getting the value that they wanted. Uh, and even then beyond that, obviously, it's a, it's a regular sort of, um, you know, day-to-day -day activity and management of it, um, scheduling in the regular conversations, the minimum annual scheme review and health checks and so on, and really any other support that, uh, that is required. So that's the journey in kind of six. Um, if we kind of look through just the um, evaluation stage, first of all, um, this, this is the assessing, this is the piece where we are assessing the opportunity. Um, what kind of business is involved, ap underwriting appetite, um, looking at the pricing and the financials. Um, and so we'll quickly get to a yes, uh, yes, no evaluation and sign off. The build I've kind of mentioned already, but you are, are into the detail there. So documentation, policy wordings, um, making sure the product includes all the right features and benefits for customers. Um, making the underwriting rules, building that delegated authority and the rates and building the whole sort of um, proposition ready to go live. And then finally, it is that go live, tracking it, support conversations, development and what have you. And then just to finalise this piece, um, I thought I'd include this slide. So the, there's, a, there's a number of kind of streams we're looking at here when we're planning um, a, a So um, the first piece is really around um, is around you effectively. Um, so you know, is there is there expertise in a particular sector? Um, you know, have you got real insight into uh, the customer, the customer needs, um, and access to them? Uh, and the underwriting expertise sort of sits alongside that as well. What are the particular underwriting issues to consider in this space? So there's a great conversation there about. Um, to what extent, you know, within the delegated authority, how far do we want the, the, the various functions uh, to be shared, et cetera. Um, it's always important to understand your objectives as well. So um, sometimes it's a case of, you know, the facility is just a bit tired. Um, competitors are doing better than you are, um, and it's all kind of needs a bit of reinvigorating. So that's something we can look at. And that can sometimes be linked to a lack of attention from existing capacity providers or service issues. We are seeing a bit more of that recently. People are seeking us out because they're not really getting everything they need from their existing provider. Um, occasionally, there are performance issues. So um, if that's the objective here, if you need to move the scheme because um, there's some challenges to it, that doesn't take it off the table. It just means we need to have that conversation in the right way. Um, or potentially it's just never reached critical mass and, you know, you want to gain more, have a broader DA and, and really start to develop it. And then within the financials, all the obvious stuff here around commercials um, with commission, profit share, however the financials work, looking at the historic underwriting performance, um, the more data and the more history, the better. Great granular data, you know, large loss. Um, we're not concerned if we see a large loss or large losses uh, that's kind of what we're here to do we don't you know we don't judge it just on that uh, we effectively strip those out and then just look at what's a reasonable sort of allowance for large claims in the future um, understanding the types of claims that are coming through the profile of risk geographical spread and you know sensible underwriting and pricing kind of review effectively uh, and then uh, the market and again you're really just talking about how big's the market? How many competitors are in it? What's the size of their opportunity, the headroom? How do you access uh, the customers, et cetera, and, and effectively starting to understand the marketing plan? And then finally, the proposition and the, the broader things that we can bring to, to value. Okay, so we're kind of, um, how are we doing for time? Yeah. Coming to the end nicely. Um, so 
we, we talked about um, product oversight and governance, fair value pricing remedy. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware that, you know, the, there was a, a sort of a step change in the level of expectation from the FCA uh, that started to come through early last year. Um, we had to take a few people out of the business to effectively work on a project to um, develop um, a really um, rapidly develop um, a more thorough approach to how this was being done. Now, I think we were probably doing most bits of it, but not necessarily uh, in such a structured way. And as with most things regulatory or compliance related, um, it's not just saying, well, look, you know, we're ecclesiastical, we're ethical, we, we'd never do things that are unfair for customers. A lot of, a lot of regulatory stuff is all about evidencing um, and, and proving um, to the FCA and to ourselves um, that we're doing these things. So um, we've been doing that. We developed a, a project. We, we pretty much got to a position towards the tail end of last year, recruited a team of three just for the delegated authority business. Um, and we've been really working on, you know, what is the right framework for product oversight and governance? Um, how do we truly demonstrate that the customer is getting fair value uh, and uh, and also pricing remedy? Um, I'm sure you all understand the, the new rules in terms of motor, which we don't do, but household um, in terms of dual pricing and, you know, price walkings effectively, um, uh, you know, uh, no longer allowed. Um, and, and, and that's a good thing in our view. Um, you know, this is all about fairness for customers. So, and we, we took a view early on that we're not doing this because it's just regulatory requirement and that we've got to do it and we need to put a tick, tick in the box to carry on business. We thought we'd take a view that, you know, we're effectively doing this because like any good business, we should be making sure that our products and services are great value and good for customers and designed for customers. Um, so, you know, there's commercial opportunity there um, through doing this thorough process. So this, this next slide is just sharing um, a few sort of high level um, findings, if you like. Uh, we've been doing this for sort of six to 12 months uh, and just a few points to put out here. So it is, it is a big investment um, if you want to get it right and if you want to get value out of it. Um, but as I say, we've we've done for the delegated authorities, we've recruited a team and the way we've built it is, I think, in the main, whilst there's still some responsibilities left with the cover holder, um, big element of it is we've built a framework and we can do most of the legwork. They're very pragmatic, you know, it's detailed and thorough, but um, it's only ever, you know, appropriate for, for the amount of value that we'll get out of it. We, al we also... Um, quickly understood that maybe initially we thought, you know, some of the smaller uh, deals and arrangements and delegated authorities, um, we'd be able to do a bit more of a light touch version. But the reality is the same obligations exist. So whether it's a small scheme or a large scheme, um, we, we really do the same job effectively. Um, and it is very thorough. Um, uh, and that next one talks about understanding competitive propositions. So um, it's a it's a big piece of work, but it's a real chance to properly assess how our product and service and everything compares um, to key competitors in that space. Um, and yeah, we are actually already understanding that whilst we thought our product was strong in all aspects, we're finding things where um, you know competitors have introduced stuff in recent years. So you know we're not just doing this to sort of say we understand it, we're coming away from that. And we're already generating quite a bit of work in terms of um, needing to improve um, our propositions and start to get back on the front foot with those. We've definitely understood that we can improve customer documentation. Um, insurance is generally a, a, a technical um, product uh, and there is a, you know, there's a lot of detail in a, a policy wording and a schedule and what have you, but you know, I think we were starting to see that um, where we previously added extra covers through endorsements or made changes, the, you know, unfortunately, it was already a long policy wording. And now there's quite a few extra endorsements uh, churning out for every customer. And it's getting quite hard if it's not already for customers to to fully read and understand it. So 
we have uh, basically um, we, we basically got to the point where yeah we, we, we're looking thoroughly at how we can make customer documentation even better and even clearer just to to make sure that customers understand what they're buying and it's all very clear for them and then um, yeah the last couple there is one there about um, cover holders recognizing complaints now um, that, that that's an interesting one we do quarterly go through a process of asking all cover holders um, for details of any complaints uh, and every quarter we we slightly sort of surprised at the limited number of complaints now that's not because we think people will be getting it wrong uh, and that there's all sorts of bad practice out there far from it i'm sure it's all great and the number of complaints should be fairly small but we're a learning business we do want to understand we want to see if there are any trends we, we need to get some of that feedback so that we can put it back into the loop and um you know to sort of um get that whole sort of proposition improved again so um you know are, are we genuinely seeing all the um, expressions of dissatisfaction captured um in my mind i don't think we are and we're probably just starting to uh um push a bit harder and maybe a bit deeper just to check we do get through uh all that sort of complaint information just for just to help us develop further so um yeah there's 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 a fair bit in terms of initial findings um we are um well uh, embedded in this now the regulatory side of thing great team working on it happy to talk to any you know delegated authority holder about how we do that um and it's um it's still fairly new to us there is still a bit of sort of development and progress um but you know we're still learning and um yeah i think it's it's now a very very strong part of our proposition so um yeah that's pretty much taken the 40 minutes i predicted um, very quick recap then just to say look we've covered the business model um, hopefully you know about ecclesiastical you understand we're part of the benefact group uh, and the charitable donations aspect of it um, the risk appetite the key message there is it's broad um, have a conversation with specific that you do need to um, talk to us about um, and how we develop those partnerships um, not just to be a silent partner but really true active engaged partner within the approach we effectively um, we have a really solid approach in terms of six steps that help on board and develop a scheme so uh, i've given an understanding of that and then just yeah just finally we just shared that bit of knowledge there around um, there's lots to do in the regulatory space um, it's all good stuff it all makes sense for customers and because of that, it makes sense commercially as well. So um, we've developed a lot there. And uh, again, happy to talk to anyone um, to provide more detail on that. So uh, that's it in terms of um, uh, slides. I, I hope, Julia, that that was coming across clearly enough. Yeah, I, I do want to extend apologies because you were dropping off just you know in and out of the sound. but. As I say, I don't think it was too bad that it, it detracted from the message that you were giving and, and it was very infrequently. So, no, that, that's fine. But thank you for that. Um, really interesting presentation, and particularly for me anyway. The, the risk appetite that surprised me and, and perhaps I should have been more aware. But I think it was on slide 10 um, where you mm. listed um, the, the breadth of your risk appetite. So I think that was particularly interesting um, so thank you for that. Um, so we haven't got any questions at the moment, but uh, I'd like to invite delegates to ask questions if you have any. Hello, Jeff. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Julia. Um, really good. Um, first, firstly, I'd like to just say thanks for uh, what's clearly a very well thought out proposition. Um, um, so congratulations to Ecclesiastical on that. Um, but what, one question, though, is what is the average onboarding time for a new scheme? It's a really good question, Jeff. Uh, and it's one of those where the average will tell you part of the story. But uh, I think the quickest we've ever done one is three weeks. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the arrangement needed something very quick. And, uh, you know, we were able to pull out. And there are actually three policy wordings. 
uh, uh, needed for that one. So um, I wouldn't want to wrongly say that we can always do it in three weeks, though. There are there are more complicated ones, um, and they push out, uh, you know, maybe into the months. The average, though, generally is about eight weeks. So that's from initial inquiry, full understanding, uh, financial assessments, agreeing to do it, and then uh, basically just going into the build to get it live. So, you know, I think um, I think we're pretty proud of that. We've got a team that is fully dedicated on it. We're in full control of pace and direction of which ones we're prioritizing. So um, it's, 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 it's a fair reflection to say it's an average of eight. But of course, the more complicated it is, uh, that can sometimes push out. Thank you. I think uh, the, the average of eight is, uh, should be one to, to be maintained. That sounds uh, yeah. pretty impressive. Um, so I've got a question, a quick question. Uh, what's the minimum year one GWP requirement for a DA? Good question again. So um, we are, this, this isn't hard and fast. We're generally going to say that um, if it's got a year one GWP of £500,000, uh, that's immediately of interest. But um, anything smaller than that, it's probably more about the conversation of where is it heading and what's the opportunity? So is there room for growth? How long has it been trading? And of course, if you go all the way down to zero, uh, speculative schemes uh, are always good conversations as well. Um, every big scheme out there started at zero. So, you know, we don't want to be uh, ignoring those. Um, but yeah, gen generally, it's a short answers, 500,000 upwards, but really open to understanding more about any scheme. Thank you for that, Anthony. Um, we don't have any other hi. questions. Hi, Julia. Hi. How, oh, hi. How are you, Michael? Hi, that's about Julia. How are you? Good. Very um, well, thank you very much. you have a question for Anthony? I have, Anthony. Ella. Thanks very much for the presentation, Anthony. Um, I'm actually based in the Republic of Ireland market, um, and we're members of the MGA fairly recently. Um, could I ask, is this risk appetite exclusive to the UK market, or does it extend to the Republic of Ireland as well? So uh, this, uh, these are good questions today. Uh, it, within, within the business area I work in, it's UK, um, uh, and a lot of that's to do with Brexit. Ecclesiastical does have a branch, an Irish branch, uh, and they do do delegated authorities as well. So um, we should be able to provide a solution one way or the other. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. So, Anthony, should Michael want to pick that up, is, is it okay to, to make an introduction to you, or do you want yeah. to drop me contact details for someone that I can introduce to Michael. Either yeah, way. Mike, yeah, Julia, if, if you send Michael over in my direction, we've had a new few of these in the past. Uh, my colleagues in uh, Republic of Ireland, we can double in office. We can hook anyone up. Thank yeah. you. That's really Thanks. helpful. Thanks for the Good question, much. Michael. Thank you very much. Okay, so another question. Um, assuming Ecclesiastical has silo-based underwriting, so would would the first step be to talk with the underwriting department to ensure underwriting appetite is in line with the structure? So actually the first step with any scheme inquiries straight into this uh, delegated authority team, uh, the, the underwriting appetite, we've got some local authority to, um, you know, agree immediately. Uh, if it's something a bit more out there, if it is, for example, farm, uh, we'll engage with our colleagues in uh, effectively head office underwriting, but really any any inquiry for any delegated authority into the team, and we're we're best placed to answer that. Thank you for that. Um, again, no question just at the moment, but if there's anybody else on the call who wanted to unmute and ask a question or drop a question into the chat, please feel free while we, we've got. Anthony on the line. Okay, um, so I'll uh, I'll just close up by saying thank you again so much, Anthony, for stepping in in place of Tony. 
Um, as I said at the top of this call, it, it's never good to drop in on someone else's presentation and slides, but I think you've done uh, an exceptional job of, of using the slide deck as it is and, and sharing a lot of information about ecclesiastical. So we really do appreciate that and, of course, your time. Um, I will put Michael in touch with you. And um, if anybody else should have any questions post-event today, then do feel free to drop them into either myself or info at MGAA. And Anthony has said he'd be happy to answer any questions post-event. So um, it just leaves me to say thank you to all of our delegates today for joining us. As Anthony said, it's a sunny day, so you've missed out on a little bit of lunchtime sunshine. So it's all the more appreciated. Um, once again, thank you, Anthony, and I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.